we're never there. It's always in development. Uh, the world is now a kind of beta version, just that it's going to stay that way. So if you look at the Arab Spring, for example, in Egypt, and I know, you know, three years, four years down the line, the Arab Spring isn't quite what it started out as, but if you look at just the, um, uh, the presentation of the Arab Spring, it was about the static structures of government, of, government, uh, of the static structures of political organisation, the hierarchies of political organisation, say, especially in Egypt, being challenged by the people at the bottom. Um, you know, the individuals with mobile devices, with connections, and you can look at, even for 15 or 18 years back to political unrest in the Philippines, how mobile devices have been used as a catalyst in political change. You know, and so I've, I've, I wrote an article about a kind of Arab spring of education, you know, where you look at the static institutions, the static professions, the static curriculum, and then on the other hand, the fluidity or the mobility of just everyone or everyone else, um, you know, creating their own organisations or their, you know, and very, very fluid. You know, um, a Finnish researcher has talked about wildfire, you know, just like kind of information communication networks just springing up and springing down, you know, just. Um, or has talked about uh, kind of bird migration, you know, as, as, as that as a very as another metaphor for the kind of social change that we might be seeing in ways that you said manage. Well, actually, that we can't manage, um, and maybe we'll just have to get used to it. Maybe we'll just have to get used to feeling uncomfortable or uneasy. Um, but then that begins to take you to a kind of very postmodern argument about. You know, this is the end of the Enlightenment. Um, this is what we started in, I don't know, 1789 with the French Revolution, you know, thinking that our brains could organise everything for us and everything would be simple and we could kind of figure out what was cause and what was effect and what was good and what was bad. And all of a sudden, uh, it's a much more fluid and chaotic world. Uh, a um, Polish sociologist talks about um, liquid modernity kind of meaning everything's fluid and everything's changing um, and computer scientists would probably say um, permanent beta. In terms of the established press, Ministry of Information, BBC on the one hand, you know, the old world, and then on the other hand you have citizen journalism. People using camera phones, and sharing on Facebook to generate their own news coverage. And clearly, you know, there's a myth or a mythology that that's now democratic. Well, of course, it's not democratic. Um, they're using the technologies of American corporations. They're using Google um, and they're using YouTube. Um, but there's still a, still a powerful myth that we are moving from a world controlled by Rupert Murdoch you know, or News International or, or the Ministry of Information to a world where people make and share their own news. Like I say, if you look slightly more deeply, it's not, it's not true. Um, it's being controlled by, like I say, Google or... Nevertheless, it's a new way of uh, producing and consuming um, and transforming and sharing news. I mean, I don't think the BBC produce the truth um, and I don't think any particular government ministry of information produces the truth. They may produce a consensus or they may represent a consensus, they may actually represent the views of rich or powerful people or rich or powerful classes um, and maybe Google represents the technology of a different rich and powerful class that now lives in Silicon Valley not in central London. Um, and it may be that what we're calling the democratic uh, or demotic uh, social media are just a way of surfacing some of the views that 
the old ways of doing things would have suppressed or would have called uh, subversive. Um, you know, and I can, I can have a picture of um, bombings in central London uh, taken by people with their camera phones uh, and the conventional truth from the BBC would have been that that was a terrorist outrage. Um, but actually there are other truths that are on offer, you know, and so there is a different truth that may be saying that this is um, jihadist revenge, you know, this is divinely ordained, this is the path of the warrior, um, you know, just that that, that truth, so-called truth, um, is not the one that would have got any visibility through the BBC. They would be telling a story about brave Londoners, uh, victims, um, but someone else would be representing them as part of an oppressive Western capitalist system. Sorry, you mentioned trust as a way of um, making decisions about what we choose to believe and who we choose to believe and whether those sources um, are maybe face-to-face -face or online doesn't make a dramatic difference. Um, but we've obviously got some skill about trust in face-to-face -face relationships and not just trust but um, authority or loyalty or laziness. You know, any of those might be the reasons why we believe what people tell us face to face and any of those reasons loyalty laziness authority or trust might be the reasons why we believe what we consume in online media just that again that, that the sudden change in technology its power and availability means we're not used to it we haven't adjusted to it to it and this conversation in 50 years time um, when people go into your archives in 50 years' time, they might wonder what, really, what was the problem? I mean, certainly there's a, a comprehensive but creeping view about how the technology allows intrusion and, and surveillance. And the fact that, um, I don't know, Google Analytics can tell us all so many different things about how we behave online or how we behave when we're learning is probably only part of the same picture that also says when I'm in England um, CCTV security cameras take my picture 300 times a day um, you know or when I'm in Palestine the Israeli security services are listening to my telephone conversations um, uh, again it's I guess it's all part of an, a world which we need the skills and the confidence to get to grip with and you know I don't think it's going to go away and it's not going to stop and we can't necessarily change much of it but uh, we've at least got to recognize what it is when we consider when we think about learning analytics there is a lot of conversation about um, privacy and confidentiality um, and I think that debate is a good debate and is fairly mature people have noticed that there are ethical dimensions to to learning analytics and i think probably the next step should be thinking about the ways in which the learners can be part of those conversations that maybe that it can be used in better ways to improve what what you might call their metacognition so they can understand more about their learning so they can learn about their learning um, and so they can learn about the, the choices they make in their learning, who should they learn with and what should they learn and when should they learn it and what has worked for them in the past. So I think, um, I think it's neutral, you know, that there's, a, there's a lot of possibilities um, and a lot of opportunities but we need to bring everyone in and explain all of those opportunities and maybe some of the challenges and the problems as well.